Hey everybody, Pastor Scott here. And on behalf of Pastor Sexton and everybody at the Worship Center, we'd like to thank you for viewing. If you're from our viewing area, we'd like to invite you to our service Sunday morning at 1045. We are located at 420 Cardinal Drive in Bourbon, Illinois, and we would love the opportunity to connect with you. If you have Twitter, follow us at My Worship Center, or go to our website, myworshipcenter.net. There you can view the Worship Center replays, see our upcoming events, and learn more about our ministries. Whether you are homesick, working, or watching from a long distance, it's our prayer that you'll be uplifted and encouraged. Thank you, and we hope to see you soon. It's a perfect day outside. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. And we're going to baptize. We have a couple of folks that uh, are following the Lord and believers' baptism. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It's a wonderful thing, believers' baptism. And, uh, you know, baptism doesn't save you. If you was, uh, uh, if you was uh, as you've heard me say many times before, if you really don't know Christ and you're baptized, all you got was wet. But if you profess Christ as your Savior and know him in your heart, then the Bible says that we're supposed to be baptized as a, as a testimony of the one that you're following and so that is such a good uh, that is such a good good thing that people get saved and follow the Lord in believers baptism so before we start let's open with prayer uh, would you stand very uh, just uh, for a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer today father in the name of Jesus thank you for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you to to learn of you to follow you and today father we thank you for this special day as believers have come to be baptized uh, signifying that they are followers of the lord jesus christ father this is a special time in the lives of believers and father we pray that today would be special as well would you guide us and direct us today in this service and we'll give you the praise for it all in jesus name amen now before you're seated would you turn around and shake hands with two or three people and shake their hand, give them a high five. A high five. A high five. And tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord today. Amen. And thank you for being reseated. Thank you for being seated today. This is Peter, and uh, it's a great day for Peter. Peter, do you know the Lord is your Savior? Yes, I do. And upon the profession of your faith, I baptize you today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
This is Barbara, and upon her profession of faith, we baptize her today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And let's give uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the best praise that we've given him all week long. He's worthy of all of our praise. Amen. And uh, let's begin reading from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. I'm reading from the King James Version. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, those of you that write in your Bibles will note that I've preached from this passage before several times. But it never, ever, ever gets old to me, this passage of Scripture. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen. amen that 21st verse says unto him be glory in church by christ jesus and if the lord will help me for the next few minutes i want to preach on the subject all glory belongs to him amen. all glory amen. belongs to him Father, touch us in the next few minutes. Help us realize just how, how feeble we really are and how you really do deserve all the glory because without you, we are absolutely nothing at all. We can't even breathe unless you put breath in our bodies. And for that, we're thankful today. Father, I pray that someone here that is struggling uh, today would leave here free from their struggle. I pray that someone that is here today that needs a touch of God in their life would receive that touch today. Those that are needing to be healed by the power of God, I pray, God, that you'd heal them today. Father, that you would have your perfect way in this service. And for these things, we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I bless you. Thank you for being seated today. Our God deserves all praise. Our God deserves all honor. Our God is worthy to be praised. You say, well, I don't feel like it today. Well, let me help you a little bit with that. You might have felt like it last week, but just because you don't feel like it today don't mean that he's not worthy to be praised because if he was worthy when you did feel like it to be praised, he's worthy when you don't feel like Somebody say amen. And he's worthy to be praised. And I make that statement without any fear of significant contradiction. For as you understand and see the awesomeness and the grandeur and the glory of the living God, it ought to thrill you that this great God of the universe chose to include in his plan people like you and people like me. Uh, not only does he choose to include people like you and people like me, into his glorious scheme of life's activities, but he has chosen us to come into relationship with him. And when we come into relationship with him, he blesses us in ways that literally astound us. And it gives us the opportunity to gather in sacred spaces such as these this morning, each and every Sunday when God's people gather together here at 420 Cardinal Drive, it should be noted that praise ought to be evident in this place. Now, I, I don't care how you do it. I don't care when you do it in the service. But it is most important that you understand that we come here for one reason and one reason only. 
and that is to lift up the name of Jesus and to praise him in this house. Can I have an amen from somebody? And when you think of everything that God has done from the beginning of creation to this very moment in time, you ought to give God glory. You ought to give him glory that's due to his name, for the scripture tells us that he is worthy to be praised. Now, I've said that about three times already, and yet there are some people who have just sat there and looked at me as, you know, my old expression, like a cow looking at a new gate out on the farm, and you've not responded. But I'm going to give you one more opportunity again on this Sunday morning to give God great glory that is due unto his name, because he's worthy of our praise. Oh, yes, he is. Hallelujah. We serve a God who is limitless in power. We serve a God who is mighty in battle. We serve a God who looked beyond all of our faults and saw our need. We serve a God who awakened us to brand new mercies this morning. And if the Lord spares our lives to awaken again tomorrow, he will awaken us with fresh mercy and new mercy tomorrow. Not stale mercy, not leftover mercy, not mercy that was handed down from generation to generation, but the Bible says that every morning there is brand new mercy. We, we need brand new mercy every day. Somebody say amen. Because every day we engage in some brand new struggle. And every day we engage in some brand new mess. Oh, go ahead and preach, preacher. And God has fresh mercy for our fresh mess every day. And I'm grateful to know that we serve a God who does not run out. He's not low on supply. He does not run out on mercy. He does not run out of grace. He does not run out on love. He does not run out on his generosity. He is full of kindness. He is full of compassion. He is full of forgiveness. And every time we turn around, God just keeps making a way for us where there seemingly is no way. Hey. Every time we open our eyes, he keeps doing great things for us. And, and some things that we take for granted and even neglect to remember. How, how many of you uh, here today, how many of us have ever thought about the fact that our lungs have expanded and contracted over and over and over and over again just since you've been sitting in this building today. I mean, did any of you sitting in here today, did you consciously make the statement even in your own mind to say, you know, I've made up my mind. I think I'm just going to breathe the next hour while I'm here. No sorry, Bob. It happens because God takes good care of you and God takes good care of me. Oh, to be kept by the power of Jesus. Amen. You, you see, there's some people in here that are kept people today. There's some kept sisters in here today, and there's some kept brothers in here today, not because you've lived so well, not because you've gotten everything right, not because you haven't fallen short of God's glory, not because you've done everything you're supposed to do, but you've been kept by the power of God because of God's favor, because his kindness has been extended to you. And a God who woke me up this morning and a God who, I'm about to get happy in here today, and a God who woke me up this morning, and a God who put breath in my body, and a God who has provided for me according to his riches and glory, and his kindness that has been extended to me, great God Almighty, who would not want to serve a God like this? So it behooves us every time that we think of God's goodness to make sure that we give God the glory that's due unto his name. We cannot sit silently in the sanctuary like statues and neglect to express our appreciation to God because he's done so much for every one of us. Now you're looking around saying, well, I don't know that he's done that much for me. Honey, let me tell you, you're here this morning, ain't you? You got up, you got a sound mind this morning, don't you? I mean, you've got breath in your body today. Your heart is still beating. I'm telling you, we should never neglect to express our appreciation to God who has done so much much for 
us. And pastor has come by just one more time to tell you today that our God is good. Our God is good. Our God is good. He's been better to me than I've been to myself and he's done so much for me that I cannot tell it all. Hallelujah. I wish somebody helped me preach in this place today. And Paul, the great apostle of the Lord's church, this great teacher, this great preacher, this pastor, seeks to help the people of God gather together at Ephesus to help them understand that they have a God who's been so good to them that every time they gather together as God's people, they ought to give God glory that is due unto his name. I've come by here to tell you today one more time that every time we gather together, whether it's on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or just to have cookies and and coffee out in the foyer, we ought to gather together and we ought to give God glory that is due unto his name. Can somebody say amen today? I love the way Paul gives to us this great epistle called Ephesians. He gives to us a well-written, tightly packed document that helps us understand our relationship with Jesus Christ that we might become comprehensive Christians, that we might have complete understanding of everything that we need to understand to uh, to be the people of God that we profess to be. Paul wants the people gathered together at Ephesus and to those of us that are gathered together here at Worship Center to understand that it is one thing to come to church and it's a whole other thing to be the church. Uh, Paul simply doesn't want them to have church. He wants them to be the church. I'm amused sometimes. We used to have this thing we'd say a long time ago. It didn't matter if we did any mission work. It didn't matter if we did any benevolence. It didn't matter anything. But if we'd come together and if we'd shout on Sunday night, we'd look at one another and say, man, we had church, didn't we? How many of y'all been to that church before? Yeah, we had church, didn't we? Yeah, we had church. And uh, that's having church. And let me just tell you that nobody likes to have church any better than me and Scotty. Scotty will shout at the drop of a hat and he'll bring the hat and he'll drop it. Uh, We like to have church, amen. We don't care who's looking at us. We don't care if you're looking at us all bug-eyed saying, my God, what is he doing up there? I'm dancing, don't you silly? Don't you know that's what I'm doing? I, I mean, I like to have church as well as anybody, but Paul doesn't simply want us to just have church He wants us to be the church. And just as he writes to those first century Christians, he writes to us today to let us know that there are some things about who we are as the people of God. In chapters 1, 2, and 3 in the book of Ephesians, Paul writes to the church and lets them know about doctrine. In uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6, he lets them know about discipline. Because if you're going to be a comprehensive Christian, you must also engage in discipline. Oh, it got quiet in here. I lost a few of you right there. In chapters 1, 2, and 3, he talks to us about our beliefs. In chapter 4, 5, and 6, he talks to us about our behavior. If you're going to be a comprehensive Christian, beliefs and behavior go together. In chapter 1, 2, and 3, he talks about what we know. In chapter 4, 5, and 6, he talks to us about what we do. Because if you're going to be a comprehensive, complete Christian, uh, what you know and what you do ought to go together. Oh, help me preach in here today. You can't leave what you learn here in the sanctuary. you got to take it to the street so that the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ can shine through you and you won't just keep your light under a bushel here at the worship center, but you'll let it shine so the whole world will know that Jesus has made a difference in your life. Listen, you ought to live in such a way that people look at you and say, great God, 
I don't know what happened to them, but they ain't what they used to be. I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. I, I, I'm not what I need to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Amen. And I need uh, two or three or five or ten of you in here to witness boldly and testify about how good God has been to you. I, I wish somebody in here would say, I'm working on getting my behavior and my beliefs together, my doctrine and my discipline together what I know and what I do. You see, I know you're not perfect. I'm not perfect, but I am being perfected by the Word of God. Look over at your neighbor and say, I'm being perfected. I tell people all the time, I'm a work in progress. I've not arrived, Brother Wright. I, I'm just on my journey. I'm still a work in progress. I'm not perfect by any sense of uh, the being, the word, amen. But I am being perfected. So we are moving to not only understand doctrine, but likewise also to understand discipline. And Paul puts it together in such a way that when he comes to the conclusion of the doctrine at the end of chapter 3, he lets us know that not only do doctrine and discipline go together, not only do beliefs and behavior go together, not only do what we know and what we do go together, but he's also letting Letting us know that prayer and praise go together. That when you pray, every one of your prayers, listen, I'm going to help you. When you pray, it should be more than God, I need this. God, I need this. God, help them do this. God, help this. God, I need this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. But, but, but every one of our prayers ought to include not only petition, but every one of our prayers ought to include praise for a God who is and for a God who is doing something in our life. He literally suggests, church family, that if you know that God is hearing your prayer. How many of you believe God hears you when you pray? I thought I was in the right place. Uh, if you know God is hearing you when you pray, and if you believe that God is answering your prayer, before you shut that prayer down, there ought to be some praise in that prayer because you know that your God is able to do exceeding abundantly about what you've asked for. Oh, some of you missed your shout cue right there. He literally says that if you know that this God to whom you're praying can do what you need him to do, that you ought to seal your prayer, every prayer that you make. You ought to seal your prayer by lifting up your voice and giving glory to God because you know that the answer is already on its way. And you begin to walk in expectation every day because if you believe that God is able to do it, you ought to walk like he's about to do it. So Paul begins to close that first part of it, and he closes it in, in prayer. And I, I like this because when he gets to the 14th verse of the third chapter, he begins to talk about, uh, he begins to talk about God and, and about what's going on in the lives of the Christians to whom he's been teaching. And after he teaches them about Christocentric understanding, Christ at the center of it all, of their relationship with God, meaning that their relationship is all wrapped up in Jesus, and how many of you know our relationship should be already wrapped up in Jesus for what he's already done? See, you could be in hell today, but you're breathing and you're here. You could be lost today, but he saved you. Amen. And so our relationship should be so wrapped up in Jesus and what he's already done and when he shuts down this section on doctrine, he seals it with prayer. And when you look at the last few verses of chapter 3, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I'll get through all, all three of them or not, but, but he, he tells us some things. First of all, he, he, he gives to us, first of all, what I like to call the pastor's prayer. What I like is that Paul is not only a great apostle and a great teacher and a great preacher, but he's also a great prayer warrior. And he believes in praying over the people whom God has given over his charge. I like this because this praying man begins to ask God's blessing upon God's people. Because in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, For this reason, I bow my knee unto God. And he begins to call on God on behalf of God's people. And then he begins to pray a three-point prayer. 
just like a preacher. Amen. I mean, he's got to have three points in it, three points in a poem. And, and so when he begins to pray, these are the three things that Paul prays. He says, I'm praying that your people will have unparalleled strength. What a prayer for a pastor to pray for his people. I'm praying that your people have unparalleled strength. I'm praying that they might have unusual stability. And I'm praying that they might have unimaginable satisfaction. And Paul is praying not just for the church of, at Ephesus, but he's praying for the church here at 420 Cardinal Drive. And, and what he prays is that the people of God will have unparalleled strength, unusual stability, and unimaginable satisfaction. When you look at what he says in verse 16, he says that I'm praying that the people of God might have strength from the Holy Ghost in their inner being. He said, Lord, this is what I'm praying. Since my people now have understanding of what they should know, I'm praying that you will help them have strength by the Holy Ghost in their inner being. Amen. He says, I want them to be able to be strong when the world thinks that they're going to be weak. I want them to be strong even uh, when, when they don't know where their strength is going to come from. Oh, let me stop here. How many of you before have ever felt just as weak? You didn't know how you was going to have the strength to go on. And something from another world just strengthens you. And you look back and you say, I, I don't know how that happened. I'll tell you how it happened. It was the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. And he says, I want to empower them with a strength that supersedes their own ability. And supersedes their own understanding in their own minds. I, I want them to have unparalleled strength. Now this strength, church family, does not come from going to Planet Fitness three or four times a week. Don't come from going to the Y or any other place that you may go. This strength does not come from you doing your push-ups, although push-ups, I guess, are okay. I prefer to eat push-ups. How many of you old-timers understand that? If you don't understand that, you're too young, too young, too young, too young. It doesn't come from you doing push-ups. Uh, uh, it doesn't come from you walking around the block three or four times. This strength, Paul says, comes from the Holy Ghost. Now let me just stop right here and just tell you that there are some people that get, um, get, get real uncomfortable when you get talking about the Holy Ghost. Oh, Pastor, in the new translations, he's called a spirit. He is the Holy Spirit of God. Talk right. I can't even understand you when you talk like that. <laughs> spit it. Spit it. The Bible says he's a ghost. And he's the Holy Ghost. He ain't Casper the friendly ghost. He's the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. amen. And uh, this strength comes from the Holy Ghost. And this strength is not an outside entity. entity. It is on the inside, working on the outside to make sure that whenever you're taking a licking that you can keep on ticking. Oh, would somebody help me preach today? Is there anybody in here who's thankful for the strength of the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of you? I'm talking to somebody here today who can testify that when life tries to knock the life out of you, the Holy Ghost some way, somehow comes upon you, wells up on the inside of you, empowers you, and keeps you standing on your feet, even though the enemy thought that you'd be down for the count. Who am I preaching to here today? I'm talking to some people who can testify that if you knew the whole story of what we've been through, you wouldn't believe that I'm even sitting here and standing in church today, but you can testify that God gave you a strength beyond your own ability. It's not because you've lived so well. It's, be, it's not because you've done so good, but he gives me power from the Holy Ghost to keep on keeping on. Can I get a witness in here that says when I am weak then the strength of the Holy Ghost comes upon me and empowers me to keep me going now church you must understand 
This Holy Ghost that we talk about has been given a bad rap in some Christian circles. Because we've been duped into believing that the only reason why we have the Holy Ghost is to make us shout. I heard somebody one time, I was amused. They came along and they said, if you can catch the Holy Ghost, you'll be shouting. I'm like, ho, ho, wait, wait, ho, ho. Is the Holy Ghost like a, like a baseball being thrown around in the sanctuary? If you can catch him? <laughs> huh? No, 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 no. Our God loves us so much that he fills us. He fills us with the Holy Ghost. He enables us to have power on the inside that makes us not have to fall out and throw in the towel just because we got some bad news. I know some folks, they get some bad news, they're ready to quit. They're ready to take their marbles and go somewhere. I ain't going back to church. I pray. God didn't do I'm mad at God. You better be careful with that kind of talk. Only a fool talks that way. I'm mad at God. You know, only a fool talks that way. Hey, he enables us uh, to have power that when we start to throw in the towel, and we start to wave the white flag of surrender that his spirit comes upon us, causes us to stand upright and say, come on, baby, hit me with your best shot because I've got a strength that comes from another world and I'm going to continue to praise the Lord. I, I came here to ask you today, amen, to, to talk to your God. God and ask God to fill you with his spirit again because if he fills you with the power of his Holy Ghost you'll stand and nobody will be able to knock you down. You can walk in shark infested territory. You'll stand among your haters and that are coming at you in four or five different directions. Is there anybody in here today who's thankful that you serve a God who gives you the power of the Holy Holy Ghost, amen, on the inside to strengthen you. God deliver us from all these mamby-pamby, weak-kneed Christians walking around. Mamby-pamby, that was my mother's line. I need somebody in here today who, who understands that when the power of the Holy Spirit wells up on the inside of you, the power of the Holy Ghost, you ain't scared of nothing, you ain't scared of nobody. And you'll stand in power, and you'll walk in power, and you'll go to work in power, and you'll meet them devils on your job with power, and you'll go home with power. I need somebody here who knows that the Holy Ghost just ain't for church for us to come in here and do our thing, but he'll meet us at the office. He'll meet us at the job site. He'll meet us at the grocery store. He'll meet me at the mall. He'll meet me there to give me power that comes from another world. Uh, is there anybody in here today who understands and who knows what I'm talking about? That power of the Holy Spirit that comes from another world. If you do, if you understand what I'm talking about, I just wish you'd give him about 10 seconds of praise in here right now. Oh, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. He gives us unparalleled strength. He also prayed that they might have unusual stability. Look at your neighbor and say unusual stability. He prayed, Lord, I want them rooted and grounded in love. I know that life can come and give us some slippery slopes sometimes. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have been on a slippery slope before? How many of you have been on one this week? No, put your hands down. <clears throat> and he said, because life sometimes gives us slippery slopes, I want them to be rooted and grounded in love. What he's literally saying here is when the slippery slopes of life show up, you, you ought to have grounding and you ought to be grounded enough <clears throat> that, that you don't fall out uh, along the way that you're able to keep going. He, he literally says, I want you to have so much grounding that even if you bend, you will not break. Amen. I mean, life will make you tilt over every once in a while. Life will get you there and you think you're going to break, but uh, what they don't understand and people don't understand is the Holy Ghost gives you, gives you power to make you strong enough to bend without breaking. Amen. 
He says, I want them to be rooted and grounded in love. Church family, this is not just uh, theoretical for the Christian, but it is also likewise practical for us. He said, I want them them to experience love one for another. If they're going to be in the church, they're going to have to show uh, that they are the church by the way they have love one for another. Rewind, press play. If you're going to be in the church, you're going to have to show that you are the church by the love that you have for one another. Well, I can love some people as long as they'll stay on that side of the church. You hypocrite. He said, if you're going to be the church, the mark of the church is not how much we come together and celebrate, but it's how much we refuse to hate. Oh, I'm about to get in trouble right here. Oh, don't ag me on, sister. I've been watching the news lately. How many of y'all been watching the news? Now, let me preface this by saying that I don't agree with everything that's going on in our world. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor, don't agree with everything that's going on in the world. But what disappoints me more than what's going on in the world is how with a lot of people who are Christians can spew so much venom from their lips and from their heart on everybody else because something is going on in the world. Honey, you might as well get used to it. It don't get any better from here. Read your Bible. It's going to get worse. You need to learn how to live with it in this world. And here's the thing. You will never, ever, ever win anybody to the Lord Jesus Christ by becoming what they are with all your hate speech and all your hate spewing. was waiting for the rotten tomatoes to come but y'all are all right but isn't that the truth isn't that the truth I, 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 I mean you know there's a lot of things that I don't like and there's a lot of things I don't like going on in our community there's a lot of things going on that, that I really just don't care for it's not my preference it, it's not in my value system but I've come by to tell you this For every LGBT person that there is out there, we must understand that Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross to save them just like he died to save you and just like he died to save me. Oh, somebody say, preach on, pastor. But we look. I've seen preachers and everything else, all this hate stuff being spewed all across the internet and all of this Facebook and everything else. And I want to tell you, if we're going to be the church, the mark of the church is not how much then we come together and celebrate each other here on Sunday morning, but it's how much we refuse to hate whenever we leave here. Literally, literally. Paul writes and he says, Lord, when we see folks, I want them to know that the love that they have for one another, when people see them, I want them to know that they belong to you by the love that they have for people. This is not a new principle. Some of you are looking at me like I'm foreign today in my principle. But this is what Jesus wanted for us. On the last night of his life, when he talked to the Father and talked to his disciples, and he said, Lord, I'm praying that they may be as one as we are one. And then he talked to the disciples, and he said, they will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. He said, that's the only reason that folks will be drawn to you. It's because you refuse to hate and you continue to infuse the world with my love God deliver us from Christians who are always hating on one another and always
always hating on everything. God, deliver us from saints who won't speak to one another. In order for the church to be the church, we must realize and learn that our stability is found in the love of God. And if you're constantly hating on folks, you're going to be one of the most miserable people in the world. But if you will love on people, if you will love people like God loved people, amen, you will be rooted and grounded in love and we can overtake this world for our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to be light in this world, out in the community, somebody ought to know that you're a Christian by the smile on your face. They ought to know that you're a Christian by the joy in your heart. They ought to know us by how friendly we embrace one another, even for those folks who don't look like us, act like us, talk like us, smell like us, believe like us, because we are the people of God. We represent Jesus Christ. And I wonder if there's anybody in here who knows that for God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Is there anybody in here who understands that today? I'm trying to quit. I need to quit. Thank you. That's all I needed was somebody's permission. I'm good. I ain't preached since the last of April. And my body knows it today. Even if they can't find love for one another. I want them to know the love of God is so big and so amazing that it passes human understanding. He says, I want them to know, watch this, the fullness of God. Paul is praying that the people of God would get to know the fullness of God. As a boy in Sunday school, they taught us a little song. In fact, years ago, I sang this song in a quartet, and it simply said, God is so high, you can't go over him. He's so wide, you can't go around him. He's so low, you can't get under him. So you got to come in at the door. That's what we sang. But Paul says that even though he's so high and so low and so wide, I want people to understand God's fullness in a way that they'll have a testimony that says he gets sweeter as the days go by. Anybody got that testimony? So what you know about God today ain't all there is to know about God. Because somebody in here today can testify that what I knew about God five years ago has now been exponentially multiplied to know about God right now. I want to say that one more time. Everything that I knew about God as a child, I did not learn it all when I was five, six, seven years old and that was it. I didn't learn all there was to know about God whenever... I started preaching back in 1985. I didn't know all there was to know about God. I would look at my mentor, Brother Atkinson, and I'd say, Brother Atkinson, I feel so inadequate. He said, it's because you are. He never would let you, you know, feel proud. He'd keep you humble. We're inadequate. I did not learn everything there was to know about God 30 years ago. In fact, the last five years, the last 12 months, the last 30 days, I continue to learn more and more and more. His knowledge is exponentially multiplied from what it was when I first learned Jesus loves me, this I know. Although I think that that's the greatest theological statement that's ever been penned. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Greatest theological statement ever made. Somebody say amen. amen. So Paul says if you keep walking with him and if you keep talking with him, he'll let you know more and more and more and more as the days continue to pass. Jared, where are you? 
I, I, I need him to, to, to come ahead. I'm, I'm not done, but I need to be. I'll part two this next week. Uh, but I'll have to start over and bring us up to speed. <laughs> Y'all are too fun. <laughs> Let me just mass pause here for a moment. Just press pause for a minute and just tell you. I tell people all the time, I got the funnest bunch of people to preach to ever was. <laughs> Y'all are fun. That's good. You see, looking at me saying, well, I don't know if I like that terminology or not. Well, it, it beats looking back at a bunch of people who look like they've been baptized on a, in vinegar and weaned on a dill pickle and look like your relatives come to spend the summer with you. Y'all are fun. Look over at your neighbor and say, this is a fun group. Okay. Unpress pause, press play. If you keep walking with him and talking with him and he continues to let you know more and more about him and he keeps blessing you, why wouldn't you want to serve a God like that? Who blesses us every day and every way and shows us that there's absolutely nothing that he is unable to do. Paul says, I want the people to walk in satisfaction every day. I'm trying to quit. He wants us to walk in satisfaction every day, so even if things aren't going their way, you know, there, there, there's a lot of times things don't go my way. How about you? There are times things just don't go my way. But when things aren't going my way, I want to tell you something. I'm still satisfied with Jesus. When friends are nowhere to be found, I'm still satisfied with Jesus. When the money ain't where it should be, oh, I done got up and pulled up in your driveway, ain't I? I'm still satisfied with Jesus. When the doctor gives me a bad report, I'm still satisfied with Jesus. When my children start acting crazy and my grandchildren start acting crazy, I'm still satisfied with Jesus. Is there anybody in the worship center today who will help me move on to the next point by just simply giving the Lord a clap offering and saying, no matter what happens, I'm still satisfied. I'm still satisfied with Jesus. Unto him who is able. Unto him who is able. To do exceeding abundantly. Above all that I can ask or even think. Paul says no matter what you ask or think, God can do more than that. Whatever you think, God's got bigger than that. Whatever you can imagine, God can do bigger than that. Is there anybody in here who knows what I'm talking about? God has just done more for you than you could ever imagine. I, I wish you'd take the brakes off of God for a minute and just, just understand that he truly is amazing. And he'll do, take the brakes off of him and, and understand that he'll do exceeding above anything you can ask or even think or can imagine. And believe him for everything that you need. I want you to stand all across the building. Unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Every congregation, every generation without limitation we need to praise God with great expectation. If you understand what's going on in this passage of Scripture, you, if you really study it, you will know that God uh, isn't done yet. And that everything that 
God has done and everything you can imagine him to do. Uh, the stuff that you can't even imagine God doing, God already knows. And he'll do stuff that'll blow your mind. And he'll do it for you in your life if you will just understand that God is able. Some of you have been praying the same prayers for a long time. You've prayed prayers for a long time and you still don't have the answer that you were looking for. I don't care if you don't have the answer yet. As long as you know that God is able. You understand, Pastor, I've been praying over that one thing for years now. And it hasn't happened yet. As long as you understand that God is able to do it. He's able to do exceeding abundantly. And if you believe that God is able to do it, even though you've been waiting for it. Some of you have been waiting for it for a long time. He said, but it hasn't happened. But I still believe he is able some of you are waiting on that loved one, that child, that husband, that wife to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, I've been waiting for a long, long, long time, long time. Just as long as you know God is able, you'll be all right. Pastor, my financial need is great. You, you have no idea. As long as you believe God is able, that he's able to do it. That he's able to do it, you see. And if you believe that he is able to do it, regardless of what that thing is in your life, if you believe that God is able to do it, you ought to praise God just with the expectation. One of the greatest words of the church, I'm trying to quit, I promise. One of the greatest words of the church is yet, Y-E-T. Look at your neighbor and say, yet. Yet. Get that three-letter word in your spirit. I want you to talk about it all week long. I may not have that job yet. I may not have that house yet. I may not have what I want right now, but I'll keep my eyes open and know, and know that God's going to bless me in his own time according to his own will. And if there's a believer in church who has, listen, 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 listen. If there's a believer in church here today who has a yet praise, where you're saying, I, I don't see it yet, but I still believe, why don't you just give God great praise right now? Would you do that? Anybody in here testify today, he'll fight your battle. Anybody in here testify today, he'll pay your bills, he'll heal your body, that he'll give you unspeakable joy that he'll give you peace in the midst of the storm, that he'll give you hope when you, everything is hopeless. He'll do what he needs to show that he's in charge. Anybody in here today feel like giving him glory in the church? Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness from somebody? Won't he make a way? I said, won't he make a way? Won't he make a way? To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. Take this little sermon. Use it to build faith in somebody's spirit. That we should praise you. That every time we come together, we should praise you. That all of our times together ought to have some type of exaltation to your grandeur and to your loving kindness and to your just awesomeness because God you're awesome we serve an awesome God and Father let us have a yet mentality that even though those things that, that we're praying for ha hasn't happened yet we still believe because you're able to do anything exceedingly above anything that we can ask or believe or even think of even imagine because of the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost power that resides in us Father lead us guide us and direct us we'll give you praise in Jesus name
Amen and amen.